Hello, welcome again. Uh, let's see here. Thank you for the uh, patience with the mishap with that previous uh, uh, video. And what I'd like to do today is get into uh, the uh, the Constitution and the early Republic. Uh, many of you have already turned in the Constitution, which is great. Uh, but I nevertheless want to uh, make sure that we're on the same page uh, regarding that um, that assignment. So um, looking at that assignment, right, uh, did anyone have any questions regarding what I was asking as far as putting things into three categories? Did anybody have a, any questions about that? All right. So the three categories that we have are conservative, enlightened, and um, pragmatic. Uh, conservative, enlightened were pretty, I thought, pretty straightforward. Is when you look at the uh, Enlightenment, uh, I tried to um, um, describe it in the um, second number of the War for Independence handout, right? Bernard Balin's thesis, believing that it was the Enlightenment that triggered everything. And with that, right, you have the French Enlightenment, you have Rousseau and John Locke, the rights to life, liberty, and property. You have Diderot and Condorcet, the right to self-cultivation. You have Beccaria, the right of a suspect, if you're suspected of having committed a crime. Uh, you have um, uh, freedom of expression, largely behind the First Amendment uh, with Voltaire and so forth, right? This idea that human beings are entitled uh, to certain rights, uh, regardless, uh, it, it's a government is not to con it, a government is to concede them, not grant them, because the idea is what the government gives, the government could also take away. So that's the idea, the old idea of a civic right, and they're saying no, this is not a mere civic right that in which the government can choose whether or not to grant such rights to its citizens, but this is a natural right to which it is obligated uh, to recognize uh, for the people, right? And of course, you have the blatant uh, dilemma of, you know, because when they were talking about that, they were talking about in, um, in virtue of, in, in light of being a human being. And so what do we do with slaves, right? What do we do with Native Americans? Well, of course, right, our founding fathers found a way to compromise uh, away from having to uh, address that, um, that pivotal issue. So they clearly were hypocritical when it came to those demographics. Uh, but that was, the, that was the rhetoric, at least. And so also with the, with the Enlightenment uh, coming from France and also the Scottish uh, Whig liberal movement, um, with the Scots, right? Uh, I like to sum it up, and, and I hope that I'm not just oversimplifying it, but from what I've read of the Scottish Enlightenment, it was largely libertarian. And by libertarian, right, you means that you believe government is a necessary evil, and you want it to be as controlled, as limited as possible, because you do not trust mankind uh, with uh, too much power, right? So you want checks and balances. And, and uh, Montesquieu in the French Enlightenment wrote the same thing, that you want checks and balances, uh, et cetera. Um, let's see here. Sorry, I'm looking for one more. Um, there we go. All right. So moving on and sharing the page with the United States Constitution. Uh, when you look at the Constitution, uh, you may have been, I know I myself was, when I had spent uh, some time away from the Constitution, uh, going back and looking over it, it's rather conservative, isn't it? I mean, yes, it starts with we the people, so it's hinting of popular sovereignty, that sovereignty rests with the people, that they're the ones that give the authority to government, uh, permission for government to, to rule over them, uh, to watch over their rights. Uh, but look at the reasons for it in the preamble. To secure the blessings of liberty, that's definitely enlightened. But look at like the three before that. Um, 
establish a more perfect union between the states. So consolidating power, that's conservative. Establish justice, that's an old conservative aim. Ensure domestic tranquility, an old conservative aim. Provide for the common defense, same thing. Pr promote the general welfare, same thing. And finally, an enlightened reason as the final one, to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our future. So right off the bat, it's, it's, it's relatively conservative. And you have, uh, you know, and it starts with the House of Reps, then goes to the Senate. And on the enlightened side, uh, the House of Reps are chosen or elected every two years. So that's rather, you know, keeping them accountable. So I would say that that's enlightened. Um, they have the power of impeachment in the House, and the Senate has the power to entry uh, those who are impeached, uh, an example of checks and balances over the executive in particular. So that's rather enlightened, arguably. Uh, you also have to be an inhabitant of the state in which you're representing to say that comes from the Scottish Enlightenment, that you know what life is like, uh, the people that you are your constituents know where you live to hold you accountable, um, et cetera. Uh, but then at the same time with the Senate, um, they have a staggered elections, right? Uh, every sixth year, that's a longer term. Uh, they're chosen by the state legislators, which is no longer the case, right? The 17th Amendment later on in the early 20th century will change that and they'll be popularly elected, but they were not at first. Um, and then they give age requirements, right? Uh, you have the, let's see here, you have to be 25 to be a House rep. You have to be 30 to be a senator. Some might argue that that's pragmatic, that that's just practical, right? Uh, looking for practically good results that as far as maturity, uh, political experience, uh, et cetera. And then it moves on and, and uh, it gives autonomy, uh, relative autonomy to each of the houses. They get to decide when and where to meet, right? They get to decide their own rules. They could expel members, et cetera. I might argue subjectively that that's enlightened. Um, they have to have a quorum. Uh, the majority of people present to be able to pass something. So that which is passed is representative of the majority of reps. Uh, they have to keep a journal. That all seems enlightened, right? It is, and then it says, except in times in their judgment when an issue requires secrecy. Very conservative, right? So they throw that conservative kind of caveat in there. They're privileged from arrest during the attendance and session. Uh, they shall not be questioned at any other place uh, about what that which they spoke about, et cetera. Um, and then you have Article 1, Section 8, which some people would argue is very conservative because it's giving all these powers to the central government as opposed to the state governments. And remember, the liberals were libertarians back then. It's kind of backward now. Uh, they wanted small uh uh, small decentralized government to better help keep people um, accountable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, but others would say, you know what? All these things that are on here are very practical. So I've had students put Article One, Section Eight under the um, the category of pragmatic, right? To borrow money, to regulate trade between the states and with foreign nations. Um, this is all given to Congress uh, to make rules on naturalization, on bankruptcies, coining money, deciding on weights and standards and measures, uh, dealing with counterfeiting, having a post office, uh, giving out patents for inventions, uh, uh, comprising uh, Supreme Court uh, or, or um, the later appellate and other um, state level um, lower level uh, courts, uh, Congress has power over that, uh, to declare war, to raise an army uh, and a Navy, to call forth the militia from the states and, and, to, and to make them fight for the federal government rather than the, the, the states, uh, to suppress insurrections that may arise, right? So again, oftentimes I find my students either putting this as conservative or as pragmatic. Uh, and then it ends 
uh, in Article 9 with uh, something that is, is relatively enlightened for the late 1700s. No title of nobility shall be granted in the US or recognized. So we're not going to have a landed aristocracy uh, here in the US, right? Aristoi meaning the best in Greek, those who have privileges over other people. That's not to be tolerated here in the United States. Um, and then 10, is this practical or is it very conservative? Uh, no state shall enter into its own treaty or alliance or confederation. Uh, they can't lay taxes on imports and exports. That's the national government's purview, right? And uh, yeah, so uh, moving on. Uh, the president, right, Article 2, uh, term of four years, but the Electoral College, that Byzantine system, uh, I've had people say that that's practical. I've had people say that that's conservative because it should, the president, according to enlightened rhetoric, should be just merely poverty elected. And you know that we've had at least two presidents that lost in the popular vote, but they won in electoral points. And a lot of American citizens were not happy about that. Um, you have to be a natural born citizen to run for the presidency. You have to be 35 years old. So is that conservative, uh, not allowing an immigrant to, to run for president? Is that pragmatic? Okay, so but please, if you would, put a um, at least one sentence describing why you put what you put in that category, right? This is conservative because, this is enlightened because, this is pragmatic because, all right? Uh, the president has to enter an oath of affirmation uh, to follow the constitution. Most people would decide that that's enlightened. Uh, the fact that he has to give uh, information on the State of the Union to Congress, as far as the collaboration of the executive and the legislative branches. Some people would say that's pragmatic. Some people would say that's enlightened, uh, that, that type of interaction. Um, but notice, right, when it is dealing with representation, going back to Article 1, see here, when they're counting the reps, it says, the, by adding the whole number of free persons, including those bound to service for a term of years, so indentured servants included, and excluding Indians not taxed, and three-fifths of all other persons, which was the euphemism for slaves. So they're excluded. That's clearly conservative, right? And then the number of reps shall not exceed one for every 30,000 uh, citizens. That's pretty conservative in my estimation one voice for 30,000 citizens, okay? That's not that democratic. So at any rate, I personally find a lot that is conservative uh, in this constitution. But before we move on to the early Republic, does ha anyone have any questions as far as that, which I'm asking about uh, these three categories? And I tried to give my best, you know, explanation up here at the top. Enlightened, any element to this constitution that is ostensibly designed to prevent tyranny. This includes methods of checks and balances of one branch of government over another, any measure intended to ensure transparency or accountability of officials to the people that they're serving over, uh, limitations to discretionary powers, right? And powers in the most democratically elected body. And in the case of the constitution, clearly that's the House of Reps, right? So I said an example of an enlightened component would be the Bill of Rights, right? The first technically nine uh, amendments. Conservative, any element to this constitution that seems to conserve early modern or medieval notions like the following, power vested in a better sort or in an elite entrusted to its own discretion without much accountability by the governed, uh, power centralized in strong central agency, like a unitary government where Washington DC rules everyone, as opposed to deliberately weakened and decentralized government like a confederacy. Uh, it, it was a balance of such, right? There are elements of a unitary government of Washington DC rule in the roost. And then there, uh, there also are elements to which the federal government has to share power with the states. 
and the states having limited autonomy. And that would be more like a confederacy. So it was supposed to have been a balance of such um, as the libertarians wanted more of a confederacy and the conservatives wanted more of a centralized government. And of course, the popular narrative, as you saw in the previous assignment, was that when we had a confederacy, uh, everyone went wild. Uh, economically, uh, politically, uh, it was a bit of a mess. And the states got themselves further indebted. Uh, they were vying and fighting with one another. And that they, the, the popular narrative is that they blew that chance, right? And it, it played right into the hands of conservatives saying, see, libertarian liberals, I told you, we need a stronger central government. And that's exactly what they got, whether they liked it or not. Uh, Jefferson stayed away uh, of, the, of the Constitutional Convention because he was a liberal libertarian and he didn't want such a strong central government. Patrick Henry, famous in the Revolutionary War, or War for Independence, uh, was opposed to it. Uh, it was too centralized, too conservative to his liking. Pragmatic, inherently amoral. So it doesn't necessarily think of right or wrong, liberal or conservative. It's simply designed for expediency, right? As a compromise between disparate factions uh, or designed to address exigencies, right? Like emergencies that may arise in the future. An example of this, sadly, may be the tacit acceptance of slavery to placate the planner faction and ensure the ratification of the document of the constitution itself, all right? And you have later on, you have um, uh, Charles Beard and his depiction in the early 1900s of the constitutional convention and him really emphasizing economic self-interest amongst a lot of those present. Uh, so hence, a lot of them had money owed to them um, and uh, were involved in businesses that they wanted a stronger central government to secure and, and, and regulate. Uh, and so that's something to be said. So historians after that, after his famous book have become more skeptical of the founding fathers looking for self-interest and them trying to keep uh, what was theirs intact. Now, granted, there are absolute uh, cases of enlightened concessions, right? Every state has to have a Republican form of government, uh, a mixed government in Aristotle's words, right? That's, that's somewhat monarchical with a, like a, a governor, uh, somewhat aristocratic with a leading uh, legislative body, but somewhat democratic. And the demos meant the people in Greek, uh, where the people have a say. And so that was guaranteed. Uh, all taxes had to emanate from the House of Reps, the most democratically elected body. So that was in line with, uh, you know, uh, taxation by representation in the rhetoric of the Revolutionary War. All right, so anybody have any questions on this assignment? All right, let's go ahead and move to the early Republic. If you don't mind. So on this one, right, the titles so often give it away. So when you're looking at number one, what's it say here? It says, even the beloved Washington did not deter Alexander Hamilton from provoking an oppositional party. So their blame in number one is going to fall on the lap, rightly or wrongly, on, uh, of Alexander Hamilton that he appeared at least to be too conservative and, and not balanced enough that it literally frightened the liberal libertarians into forming an oppositional party. Because as you probably have seen, there's nothing in the constitution uh, that set up or even mentioned uh, a two-party system. But it happens, right, when by the end of the second term of George Washington's presidency, and a lot of fingers were pointed uh, specifically at Alexander Hamilton. So he tells the states, right? Okay, the national government is going to take care of your debts. Well, that sounds great, right? It's, get, it's taking the, the, the states off the hook. 
but think like a libertarian. What the government does for good today, it could do for evil tomorrow. So now the government has its hands in the budgets of the states, right? And taking care of their debts. He also, right, uh, begins taxing and without it emanating from the House of Reps. That was not constitutional, right? It said all taxation emanates is to emanate, originate from the House of Reps. Section seven, the very first sentence of Article one. And so he taxed, ironically, tea, whiskey, and other commodities, right, to help fund uh, the national government and being able to pay off its debts. But people did not take kindly to this. And so with the Whiskey Rebellion, right, they, they said this is an unconstitutional tax. It also was their avenue to the American dream, supposedly, according to Alan Brinkley, uh, a lot of um, uh, wheat farmers who could not compete with the bigger wheat farmers found it more expedient to distill their wheat into whiskey and sell it for profit. And now they're being taxed for such. So they protested and George Washington gives his okay to raise a 13,000 man army to squash them, right? And that's larger than the Continental Army was at almost any time during the war for independence against the British. And he has it turned on his own men. So this was very alarming to many liberals and also the uh, funding the debt system uh, entailed um, subsidizing big business. Uh, the idea was is big businesses that were good for the country. So like building roads, right? Uh, starting certain new industries that it was supposed that were supposed to help the whole country. The federal government was to help fund and subsidize them. But who were the ones building the roads and starting these new factories? Wealthy businessmen already. So it seemed like the government was in with the wealthy. And then to make matters worse, image-wise, is uh, the wealthy were the ones who were buying the bond certificates. And you buy a bond certificate, the government pays you back plus interest. And who has extra money to lend to the federal government? Those who are relatively wealthy. And so... Um, it, it seemed to a lot of people that Alexander Hamilton was creating a very highly centralized, unitary uh, plutocracy, a rule by the rich, the rich and the federal government in together. And so um, then he creates a, uh, a federal bank. And then with the federal bank, right, there's nothing in Article 1 uh, I'm sorry, Article 2, the executive, because he's the Secretary of Treasury, he's in the cabinet of the executive department. You'll find nothing in Article 2 about the power of, of the executive branch to uh, create a, a, a bank of the United States. Well, he gets it through and permission from the Supreme Court by virtue of the necessary and proper clause. And when you look at Section 8, Article 1, Section 8, it's at the bottom. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution for foregoing powers. So meaning if there, there's a specified list of what the federal government of Congress in particular can do, but also anything else that's necessary and proper that's not on this list. This was a big elastic power that scared libertarians that the federal government could, could uh, capitalize on, take advantage of, and just begin accruing for itself more and more powers and say, hey, it was necessary and proper, right? And so they use that scary clause to the liberals uh, right off the bat in our first president's administration. And it worked with the Supreme Court who were not elected, but handpicked rich men. So, Finally, right, a lot of people believed that the spirit of 76 had been betrayed by Hamilton and the cronies of George Washington, right? And by the spirit of 76, you could easily guess that that is an allusion to the Declaration of Independence of 1776 about uh, natural rights, uh, uh, about uh, it is the it is the 
the job of government to protect our natural rights. The government is our servant, not our master, et cetera, et cetera. What's interesting is James Madison, who was a conservative and had written most of the Constitution, um, he switched sides. He supposedly became too alarmed uh, by that which I covered and more uh, by Hamilton, and he sided with uh, the, the liberal libertarians, uh, Jefferson in particular, and began creating an oppositional party. So that's interesting to note. Well, number two, David McCullough's contention that President John Adams, the second president, was too honest and independent-minded to be a successful politician merits consideration. So this is court history, right? It's praising a leader, okay? So you got to keep that in mind. But it's saying, right, that this guy was so honest. He, he was filled with such integrity and that integrity emanated from highly um, passionate religious conviction. John Adams was one of the most vocal Christian presidents we've ever had. And he contended that he was going to have to answer to God when he died. And he wanted to do his best in making the right decision, not that which is the most advantageous for his political party, but what was the right decision. So he ended up alienating both parties. He alienated the liberals, right, by agreeing to some very um, constitutionally dubious laws that his conservative Congress devised. So one, right, like the uh, the uh, yeah the Alien and Sedition Acts. The former tell Congress giving a constitutional right over immigration to the executive, but remember it's under Article One, Section Eight. It was initially given to Congress. They're not supposed to give up their rights and give it to another branch. That's all part of the, the, the checks and balance process, right? So now he had power to deport radical French immigrants because the French Revolution was the big thing during his uh, presidency. He made it known he hated the French Revolution. And, you know, uh, equality, fraternity, um, uh, oh gosh. Equality, fraternity, and liberty uh, were the, was the ringing cry of the French Revolution. To the liberals like Thomas Jefferson, this was the, the culmination of the Enlightenment, right? Getting rid of the monarch, uh, having instituted a new world order, a representative body that, that would govern France uh, for the sans culottes, for those who were without the fancy breech socks who couldn't afford such. And so this is like a, a you know, kind of a proletariat talk, like, like uh, liken it to like the later Russian revolution, that it's for the, the common man. Uh, they even uh, attacked the Catholic church and uh, attacked uh, organized religion and decided that they were gonna uh, institute year one of reason and get rid of the Gregorian Catholic calendar. Uh, it was it was pretty radical, right? Uh, they engaged in land um, confiscation and redistribution uh, from the wealthy. Uh, they even declared war against the culottes, uh, those who could afford the breaches, the nobility, uh, and sometimes had them executed for treason against the people. And so to people like John Adams, they took the enlightenment too far and particularly in their anti-religious sentiment that he believed it was nothing less than a movement led by the devil against the Catholic church and against Christianity, et cetera. So that he vocally opposed the French revolution, continuing that it was excessive. Um, even George Washington wouldn't outright do that, even though he was repulsed by the same, for the same reasons for the quote excesses of the French Revolution. He tried to keep it to himself and he declared neutrality uh, when Napoleon took a hold of the revolutionary army after Robespierre was killed. And um, Napoleon tried to spread his Napoleonic code, his enlightened code over Europe. And so John Adams was a lot more um, 
kind of pugnacious. He, he fought people a lot. He argued with people and, and, and uh, debated people openly and so forth. They say he was easily annoyed. Um, and so he, um, he made it very clear that he despised the French Revolution and that he was not going to allow it to spread here in the United States because we started opening uh, Jacobin associations. And the Jacobins, you know, arguably when they took over with Robespierre and Danton, uh, that, was that was arguably the most radical phase of the French Revolution. And he was having none of it. And so um, in goes in the second one, right? And that was the all right, Fry's Rebellion, Alien and Sedition Acts that I'm looking for. is Espionage Act. With the Espionage Act, he contended that your First Amendment, or his Congress did, your First Amendment uh, was, was curtailed, it was cut short, that if you uh, wrote or publicly spoke uh, anything to uh, raise a rebellion here in the U.S. or to try to, um, to uh, foment a mercenary movement to go fight for Napoleon's army, that uh, you had exceeded your First Amendment right and could be fined and arrested. And so this was the first uh, limitation legislatively uh, to the First Amendment. And a lot of liberals and a lot of Americans did not take kindly to it. They felt it was oppressive, right? And so he made enemies here clearly and he engaged in a quasi war uh, he developed um, the Navy, and he sent them to the Caribbean and, and uh, put them on the spot and gave them authority uh, to fire at will on any French uh, ships that uh, engaged in hostile acts against them. And that included stopping them to accommodate them, because both the French and the British were doing that. They were stopping, the French would stop them, right? and say, what do you have to trade and where are you going to trade it? And if they found out, they discovered that you were on your way to Britain uh, to uh, trade, you know, and, and not just war material, uh, but, but clothing, food uh, to the British, uh, the French would confiscate it from you, right? And the, and the British were doing the same thing, however, but he didn't, he didn't arm himself against the British and their violations of our rights of, 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 of economic exchange on the seas, on the high seas. He did it only against France. And there were a few episodes where uh, they tried to stop a boat and uh, the American naval ships fired upon the French, the French fired back and we lost some men and we killed some men. And uh, it was known as the quasi almost war because it wasn't declared. And the fact that it wasn't declared by Congress you know, that was another constitutional violation that made even more people angry with what John Adams' administration was up to. However, then with the conservatives, right? First of all, he doesn't enforce the espionage and, and alien acts hardly at all. Um, he, uh, I, we're dealing, I, I, if, if I can remember correctly, like the Espionage Act, which was so controversial, in violation of people's First Amendment rights, or at least curtailing them, uh, like fewer than 100 people uh, across the country uh, were ever tried and arrested for the Espionage Act. He knew how constitutionally dubious it was, and he didn't have the stomach to go on a witch hunt against uh, pro-French sentiment in his own country. And the same thing with the Alien Act. Uh, I don't believe the deportations I mean, one deportation is too many, but I don't believe the number got very high at all. So then the conservatives were angry with him that Congress had armed him with these powers and he wasn't flexing his muscles to enforce them and to carry them out and get rid of French influence in our country. So he began alienating his own party. Uh, Alexander Hamilton was a powerful conservative ally whom he alienated because he called him a vain peacock. He didn't like uh, Alexander Hamilton's ambition and his vanity. 
and he didn't think that he was doing things for the right reasons out of civic uh, virtue for the country. And so he made an, an enemy of, of a powerful conservative in um, Alexander Hamilton. Uh, Fry's Rebellion uh, was a rebellion in which uh, things got out of hand and some police officers were killed. And he looked into it as a former lawyer and said, you know what, they, um, I don't believe uh, Mr. Fry's was responsible for that death. And so he uh, pardoned him. And, and with the, a lot of conservatives, they wanted to see him executed in the name of law and order as a symbol for the liberals in the country to know their place. And then also Haiti. Uh, Haiti became a quote, black republic, right? In the Caribbean, um, uh, sharing an island with the Dominican Republic. They kicked out the French. Uh, Toussaint Levertois, uh was a black man Almost all of his army and people were black, uh, former slaves on, the, uh, on that part of the island of Haiti. And so uh, it was revolutionary uh, to, to see a predominantly black country uh, become independent um, at the end of the 1700s. And um, yeah, and it, it just, it frightened a lot of people. It frightened a lot of our conservatives down in the South. Uh, who were afraid that it might uh, encourage uh, their slaves to rebel as well. But John Adams recognized the Haitian Republic and, and wrote and spoke well of them because he was ahead of his time. And he was, uh, as a Massachusetts man, he was against slavery and for human rights for Africans. And so that alienated a lot of conservatives. So what do you know? He becomes a one-term president. He loses reelection. But according to McCullough in his biographical book on Adams, he praises Adams and says he was just too, um, too honest to be a good politician. And so it alienated both sides. Number three is the daddy issue, right? Um, Hofstadter's book, American Political Tradition. I cannot emphasize it enough. If you have time to buy that book, it's a different chapter on a different American leader each time, and it gives a psychological thesis into his upbringing, his thought process, his motivations, his influences, and it's just super interesting. So take a look at number three and see how uh, Jefferson's desire uh, to win over his dad's approval, who was seen in his eyes as a commoner, right? how um, that played into his decision to lead the party that was proud of being most democratic, the party of the common people, the Democratic Republicans, as opposed to the Federalists. All right, so take a look at the connection between his dad and Jefferson becoming a Democratic leader. All right. According to Hofstadter, they're absolutely connected, that he was psychologically trying to win approval from his dad. Number four, Jefferson felt compelled by circumstances beyond his control to violate his own rhetoric. Uh, Thomas Jefferson and Woodrow Wilson both, later on, hundred, literally over 100 years later, um, are both tackled in history books in light of the fact that they, they contradicted themselves. They, they both were men of letters and academia, writing books, and they wrote one thing in their youth, and then they, they, they led the country in a completely different manner when they became president. So you could say that they were hypocrites. You could say that age and power changed them, but instead, the textbook, when I use it, Alan Brinkley, uh, he cuts some more slack than that. And he says, you know what? Jefferson was a very timid man. He hated confrontation. Now, don't get me wrong. When he was alone in his study and he had pen and paper, he could become as confrontational 
and and just explosive with his words as anybody in his generation or after but actually face to face exchanging uh, dialogue in uh, with congress etc he supposedly had nervous breakdowns facing congress uh, one time he almost fainted trying to deliver the state of the union address to congress he was so nervous uh, when things got really um, contentious in his writings against George Washington, he was physically afraid to be in Washington's presence. So Brinkley capitalizes on that facet of Jefferson's personality and says, this guy just didn't have a backbone. He didn't change. He was still liberal in his heart and in his mind but he didn't have the stomach or the backbone to take on these changes and these forces that he confronted when he was president. So instead of being the idealistic person wanting to change and improve the world that you see in his writings, he decided to become pragmatic and become practical and say, you know what, in this given situation with the giving circumstances, I'm going to, instead of what I had written about, I'm going to do this rather than that, because this will bring about the best practical results. So take a look at one issue after another, one instance after another of him uh, not abiding by his own rhetoric. He hated Hamilton's system, his national bank but he didn't kill it, right? He wanted a crusade against ignorance and a national-based public school system, but he didn't do it. He was for uh, the limited powers of those who ruled and that they could not do anything that was not explicitly given to them as a power in the Constitution, but he bought the Louisiana Territory even though he knew it was not in the Constitution. Look at the argument for it. Look at his, his excuse, basically, his justification as to why he kept violating his own rhetoric. And then ultimately, of course, in notes on the state of Virginia, in the original, in the original um, uh, phase or copy of the Declaration of Independence, he tore into slavery, how immoral, archaic, backward it is. But he kept his slaves, and he kept a hidden love affair with Sally Hemings, and he tried to hide their biracial children. So take a look at all of it. And please remember, even if you don't choose this last number, please read it in preparation of test two. All right, so um, are there any questions? Yeah, and then the last one, uh, he tries to implement a coup uh, in Muslim North Africa and sends uh, military men to go extract Americans who have been caught and captured in Tripoli without even talking with Congress, much less getting congressional permission to do such. So just one of many examples of him going against his former rhetoric, which he had written about. All right, so at this point, can I get a thumbs up? You guys feel relatively, relatively good about these two assignments. Thank you, Isabella. Okay, before we get off, are there any questions? All right, uh, note, I wanna end by noting the next assignment I'm trying to let you enjoy because you've had to do over the weekend, right? Some work. And I apologize for that, but there was no way of getting around it. 
uh, I'm contractually obligated to cover all these subjects. And we have a very limited amount of time this summer term. But I was able to give you the 4th of July off and you don't have anything until the 6th, uh, Wednesday night, the 6th uh, of the, on the War of 1812. Uh, please take a look at that video and note that it's very, uh, it's different. It's, it's standard. Um, I want you to watch the video and, and simply answer the questions. It's not an argumentative format like these others. All right. So try to jump on that and be aware of that. And I will send you an announcement. Um, as I told you an announcement at the beginning of the semester, uh, from the 6th through the 10th, um, I'm, I'm going away. And so, um, but what I may do is I may, um, I may host a Zoom meeting uh, Wednesday, the 6th, uh, in the morning. All right, so be on the lookout for that uh, by way of an announcement. Uh, so I, I could try to give you last minute heads up on a few things, including test two, because test two will be due Friday night when I'm gone. And please remember that I'm going to try to find a balance where if I don't think a question was very clearly answered in one of the argumentative assignments or in one of my lectures, I'm going to go over it. But otherwise, I'm going to pass over it. Uh, as I warned you, I'm not going to go through every question like I did for test one. And I think you could understand why we're in college. And I don't want to do that for all three tests. Uh, but especially if there are um, textbook questions, needless to say, I'll give those out, the answers out. And so, uh, yeah. All right. So thank you guys. You'll get your extra credit for two assignments, uh, Constitution and Early Republic, uh, for your participation today with me. So I appreciate you coming. And if there aren't any other questions, I'm going to go ahead and bid you adieu, okay? All right, thank you. Thank you, Isabella. Thank you, John Lee, Miguel, Rosemary, thank you. Uh, hi, Professor, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, so the video for the War of 1812 assignment, it still doesn't work. It still says it's a copyrighted claim. I'm not sure why, but I just checked again after seeing your announcement. Wow, okay, thank you. Thank you for letting me know. Um, the only thing I can guess because I've never had this issue before, is maybe I show a quick um, a quick clip of that video. That's that's the only thing I could think of as to why someone would claim copyright issues with it. Um, okay, I will uh, I'll uh, I'll send an uh, another announcement uh, once I once I discover how to um, how to tackle that problem. Okay. All right, sounds good. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for letting me know. Yep. All right, thank you, everyone.